everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, and this, in this um, our stats club presentation, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this new uh, package available in uh, R that came out earlier this year that I've been uh, experimenting with recently called Tidy Models. Um, and just a little bit of disclaimer at the beginning. Um, I most of what I know about statistics, quite honestly, come from the past like month, month and a half of me using this package and trying to learn this package as well as I can. So kind of kind of a little bit of a preview. This package does streamline things for people who may not be the most familiar with many of these uh, methods that are embedded within this package. So it, it, if anyone might know more about what I'm talking about, uh, feel free to chime in at any point. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off again, the most the most basic from the most basic place models. What are models? Models are mathematical tools that are designed to um, best replicate the relationship that uh, data has with each other in the real world. Um, and one good example of that, that is this regression uh, plot right here, house sale price versus um, like where the house is located latitudinally, right? And so you can apply this to a variety of different, um, you, this has a variety of different applications. Obviously you can predict the future. You can, you, you, you can visualize maps with it. You can detect patterns and uh, uh, by their very nature, the models are math, they can be expressed as mathematical equations. Um, and to the right, I have these two examples, one of which I already touched on, but above you have a classification problem, which um, sort of this model seeks to uh, sort data points into different discrete cate categories or classifications. And on the bottom, you have a regression model, which deals with um, predicting continuous, you know, usually numerical values. Um, so why, where does tidy models come in? So there is a need for, um, in R, a unified user interface. And uh, the example given uh, shows that um, across all these different packages, which contain, you know, their own, their own models, um, the, the predict function across all these different packages varies uh, in terms of their parameters pretty drastically. Um, and it would require someone, uh, this isn't very user friendly. This isn't something that the normal person can pick up and just run with. Uh, it requires, you know, a little bit uh, more engagement, probably more than the average uh, R user is willing to put in. And um, there is a real need to like create a way to use all of the different models that are offered in R that are, um, that's, that's um, like I said before, user friendly. So uh, to talk a little bit more about tidy models, it, from their own website, they say that tidy models framework is a collection of packages for uh, modeling and machine learning using tidyverse principles. Of course, a lot of you are probably familiar with tidyverse. Um, so you might have an idea of what that means already, but uh, I guess to me, that means that, um, they are packages and functions that are the most streamlined for uh, uh, a user experience in terms of design. Um, some examples of that is um, are, you know, for example, don't contrive default arguments for functions. Uh, if you try to use read CSV um, and you don't supply a file name, the, the, the program will, R will ask you, the function will ask you for a file name. Um, derive default arguments from data. If you can infer what the arguments that the user should have supplied to you um, would be from the data itself, then you should um, encode it into the function to derive those uh, arguments. And take data structures that users have, not the ones that developers want. And that's actually a pretty big theme. These, these packages have all been, they all have this one unifying um, feature to them, which is that they were developed with users in mind. Um, and uh, it, it is as user friendly as they could be, you know. Um, so this is the 
this is a diagram of the average um, modeling pipeline in data analysis. Uh, you know, I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with exploratory data analysis, which is where you familiarize yourself with your data and try to understand what kind of relationships you can explore. Um, but many of these other steps are pretty unique to uh, developing a machine learning workflow. And um, we're going to be going through these steps today. Uh, and, and we're going to be using a very simple, very, um, a uh, very simple, very uh, 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 honestly rare data set um, just for the purposes of demonstration and uh, nothing more. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm gonna be hopping into R uh, real quick. Um, so let me uh, get ready for that. So if you haven't done so already, I don't know how many of you uh, want to follow along. <clears throat> but I posted the, um, I posted can you, can you show where you posted it in ARPA? So people yeah, can sure. It's in, uh, it's in, da, 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 da. it's in this R stats club. It's pinned to the R stats club, um, spreadsheet. It's the spreadsheet that's pinned to the R stats club channel, uh, you know, under slides and material, you open this up. It's a, it's a word document. And uh, it has some of the requirements. Um, um, we're not we're not seeing it on the. On our oh, um, I've, I got it. There we go. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. So let me go through that again. Open up Slack. Go to the Lieber um, R Stats Club channel. Open up pinned. Go to uh, this R Stats Club schedule. And you'll see the document that contains um, your requirements, the data set, and the code in three different formats. See, we got a chat bubble here. Uh, OK, that's fine. You can just listen. Um, yeah, and uh, by the way, following this is just for anyone who wants to follow along, not at all <laughs> required or anything like that. You can just see what I'm doing. So. Um, uh, I, just to give a little bit of background, I think it's a good idea to give some background. Um, I attended, I found out about this package by attending um, Open Data Science Conference West uh, 2020 back in late October. And there was a workshop led by um, a data scientist named uh, Jared Lander, who kind of gave this really long and like extremely thorough workshop on how to use tidy models. Um, something I was totally unfamiliar with. And honestly, I mean, there was a little bit of like an assumption of prerequisite knowledge. So while I, while I wasn't able to fully understand what he was doing, it did kind of like inspire me, motivate me to learn more about this because it was, it was really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. So tidy models, again, just to, just to, explain a little bit more. It's not just one package. It's a, like Tidyverse. It's a collection of different packages that are all like unified by a same, the same design principle and they're all like cross compatible. So, um, and you'll notice that many of these packages overlap with uh, Tidyverse packages. Um, so uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so moving ahead, I don't know, for those of you who've downloaded the data set and for those of you who haven't, um, the data set that we're working on is the, um, are, is like a table of like, table of health insurance information or like demographic information, whatever you wanna call it from about 1300 customers from just some health insurance company. And it's varies, the, the samples all like very, the, the, the individuals all vary across like region. Um, actually, let's get into it right now. So let's look at the different type of, oh, somebody requested to view. Do I not, I'm gonna go ahead and give access. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's look at the columns. All right, we got age, we got sex, we got BMI. Uh, so far, pretty interesting. Children, I'm guessing like number of children. Smoker, whether or not they're a smoker the region from which they hail. So I guess in this case, um, let's take a look. 
Uh, okay, that's crazy. Let me do this. All right, so we got the Northeast. This is very broad. We got the Northeast, um, which I guess you could imagine is like north of Maryland, maybe Delaware. Uh, the Northwest, um, the Southeast, and the Southwest. Uh, okay, yeah, I guess Southwest would include t include Texas. Southeast would include we all you know like Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, um, maybe South yeah South Carolina, um, Missouri. Missouri's kind of on the whatever, but so yeah, we have region. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, we have, um, children. So let's, let's, let, let's look at these again. So, um, age, we have mean age of 39. Okay. Um, sex pretty evenly distributed. I, I picked a very simple data set to work with, um, not just for the purpose of this, this, our stats club, but for me as well, I needed a day, easy data set to work with. Um, we have BMI. This is where things get interesting. Uh, BMI of around 30, but according to the CDC, 30 is the cutoff for obese. Um, and we have whether or not they're a smoker. Most of them are not, but some of them are. This might be important later. And we have uh, charges, which is, you know, how much this person was charged, I guess, for a given year. The mean average is about 13,000. Okay, so we got some pretty interesting information. Here, I... I saved number of children as a factor. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you exactly why I did that. I just, it made sense to me. I, I feel like children isn't, you can't have, the way I thought of it is you can't have one and a half child. You can't have a, a, frac a fraction of a child. So, but I, I don't know. It doesn't really, it doesn't really come in, come into play later in the, um, later in the uh, pipeline. Um, so I like to use this package called uh, Skimmer. Uh, which has a function called skim and it kind of just like gives you an overview of the data the whatever data table you give it and it produces these like neat little text-based histograms over here so this is just gives you another added dimension of, of of looking it gives you like a profile of the data table um yeah actually it doesn't make sense because we want we want this as well, i want to see the min and the the max of the mean. So I guess it doesn't make sense to save the children as a factor. I, I just made sense to me at the time. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, we, were, we already got a good look at um, what, what we're working with. So uh, we don't really need to um, spend too much time on this, but it is pretty cool. Um, and I would encourage you guys to check it out. Um, uh, let's see, what's going on with the children? Okay, most people in this data set have no children. Uh, who knows, maybe that'll be important um, going forward. Uh, maybe it won't. Um, so there's this other package that I uh, found out about called GG Alley that has um, a function called GG pairs. And it kind of like, you gave it a data table and it kind of just like throws all the um, different variables at each other. Uh, hold on, I wanna, I wanna make this bigger. So I'm just gonna do this. <clears throat> it's going to take a second, but it kind of just throws all of these like different um, predictors at each other uh, to see if you can just like uh, see if you can just kind of like detect something, any relationships going on. This is pretty cool, right? Like you can see, okay, what's the relationship between smoker and children? Um, uh, here, let me make it even bigger. Um, like what's the relationship between children and uh, I don't know region? You know, so it's 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 a cool package. It's very it's, it's easy for me um, as someone who's not like an expert in ggplot to just get like a quick snapshot view. Uh, but what's uh, interesting here is um, what caught my eye when I first worked with this was looking at the relationship between uh, age and charges, and you can see it's kind of like there's like three tiers to how much. So on, you can see that it kind of, there is this like baseline, uh, like increasing as you age level of um, how much you get charged from this health insurance company. And it seems like it has three levels to it. And then all, 
also you have BMI and charges. Uh, and that's, that's really fascinating too, because, um, Ooh, okay. Yeah. So like you can see that as the BMI increases, like there's this blob over here, and then there's this even bigger blob over here. And you can see that there is, there is something going on here. Um, everyone else is, is kind of even those with like higher BMIs, they're kind of being not being charged quite as much as the people up here. So that should be interesting to look at. Another thing that would be interesting to look at that everyone, I feel like a lot of people know about is smoker. Let's look at smoker, everybody. So um, uh, yeah, okay. So this, I, th I think this left side is yes smoker. This right side is no smoker. But um, yeah, you can see that, you know, regardless of how this particular plot is oriented, you got to see that there is something going on with smoker and charges, like how, whether or not someone smokes also informs how much they're charged. So, um, okay, we, 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 have some, we have some ideas. We're, we're cooking with something right now. So let's keep going. Let's see what's going on. Uh, here, I, I investigate. Um, okay, let's. Here I look at, I break it down by region. You can see that across all four regions, BMI and charges um, are related. Okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see if there is any sort of relationship with age. We already kind of looked at that, but you know, across, it doesn't really vary with any of the four regions of the United States that they have in this data set. Um, uh, okay, now this is where I think we, we are entering you know, what, what might be really informing um, the relationship between these uh, predictors and charges, which is, um, you can see that I've, I've color coded it uh, according to whether or not um, each person is a smoker. And you can definitely tell there's something, I mean, without a doubt, there is something going on. And you can see that there is a cutoff line here at 30 BMI. So, so as, as someone's BMI increases, um, people with higher BMIs aren't necessarily by themselves. I mean, they are a little bit, but not always are they um, a charge higher. And I, I, actually, you could say most most times than not, they're not charged more than someone with lower BMIs. But it's when you include smoke, you can see that these insurance costs skyrocket. Um, and that's a pretty stark difference. Um, so let's look at what this plot is here. So I try to break it down by age as well to see like, okay, um, uh, let's see if uh, the, like, let's see if there's any interaction between BMI and age on how much a person's charging. You do, you do see that like stratification thing where like at the bottom you have like the 18 to 20 year olds at the top. There are like, you can tell that there are like three distinct levels to this, to this plot here where at the very bottom where like here we saw that none of them smoked at the very bottom, um, you know, the younger you are, the less you're charged regardless of BMI. And then as you get older, you're just charged more. But then when you include smoker, it's all of a sudden you see that the 18 year olds are, they jump up um, 20 to 30 year olds, they jump up. I mean, it's by the same, it seems like by the same interval as well. Um, so it's pretty consistent uh, and it's, it's pretty interesting. And so for these reasons, uh, let's see. Well, oh, I tried to see if, yeah, children doesn't really have an effect on how much health insurance charge. So for these reasons, I thought, okay, maybe we're gonna go ahead and look at the relationship between BMI, a, a BMI age and um, smoker, smoking status. And so um, that, that concludes that uh, exploratory data analysis part of my um of my workflow here so now we're gonna actually get started on using tidy models and um uh let's see uh, our sample okay so the initial split here is a function um that uh sort of like splits it's from it's from the package r sample and it splits automatically for you a data table um, into uh, 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 training and testing sets. And um, here I fed into it our data table 
uh, without making really any modifications aside from, for whatever reason, making uh, children a factor. And I stratify it, this, this parameter here, um, strata, it allows you to stratify the split, which means ensuring that there is a roughly equal number of whatever argument you give it in each split. And so because there were so many fewer um, uh, smokers than non-smokers, I try to compensate for that class imbalance to make sure that each split has a roughly proportional um, number of smokers in it. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead, let's set the seed. We want to set the seed always. Let's go ahead and look at what initial uh, init ensure split looks like. All right, so we have our analysis, which is our training set, our testing set, and then we have our total set. It's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty, pretty nice, pretty easy. And then these two functions kind of like extract the training and testing set and store them into an object. Um, so there we go. We, we create our initial split. Now we're going to get started with um, a function called recipe from the package recipes. And um, Again, I'm, I'm kind of going through this pretty fast, but uh, so let me know if you're not um, catching or, or let me know if you're stuck or anything like that. But um, what's cool about recipes is it, 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 it stores your feature engineering. Feature engineering, it's like when you want to make the predictors of a data set that you have um, um, the most uh, you, you want to transform them in the way that is most conducive to whatever model you're using. Um, and so recipes, it kind of like allows you to pipe all of these steps into a recipe, recipe object and then use them later on, use this recipe object later on in your workflow, which is pretty cool. So um, here I define the uh, function. This isn't the, um, I, 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 this is the, this is like a very basic sort of form, sorry, formula. This is a very basic sort of formula that I define these um, data uh, having um, in terms of like re relationship wise. Uh, later I, I, I define the interaction terms, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, yeah, I, I, I feed the training data in there. Uh, step dummy, um, that kind of converts all of the nominal, nominal uh, predictors or the predictors that are like factors, for example, uh, into dummy variables, which like, if you don't know, they're just columns with like a one or a zero to indicate whether or not that row has that, uh, has that particular um, factor. Um, and then here we normalize uh, our numeric data, kind of, kind of make it less like what, like erratic, less like wildly varied. And here we define an interaction term. So I kind of came to the, I came to the conclusion that, um, BMI, uh, and I was, having, I was actually having some trouble with this step, but I, I simplified it for myself. And I, I basically said, um, BMI interacts with uh, smoker, yes. They have some sort of like synergistic effect with each other. Um, and so just like that, you can kind of just do, do um, these steps on to, uh, you just like do these things to your training data. Um, and it's just stored in, stored in, and in fact, if I, uh, if I, I, when I prep, prep, um, applies these changes and then juice extracts the now transformed, uh, data set, which you, uh, enacted these feature engineering steps onto. So now you can see that we have this new. Uh, tibble, which represents our training set, um, but it has all these transformations on it. Like we have the dummy variable smoker, yes. So this this basically um, gives a value on the likelihood that it is a smoker. Smoker no is not on here because it's kind of like um, like it, it's ex, it's defined by exclusion. And then you have the interaction term here, like. Um, the, the synergistic effect that BMI and smoking have uh, with each other. So that's pretty cool. Um, I did not choose to prep, store, like store the prep version of this recipe for reasons we'll uh, look into later, but I applied these steps onto our testing data 
And um, now if we look at Uh, now we have, as you can see, um, we have like a finalized version of our testing data with these feature engineering steps applied to it. Um, so I'm moving ahead a little bit. I, I go through everything I just explain, explained to you. Um, uh, for whatever reason, I decided to use uh, K nearest neighbor, the K nearest neighbor model. And for those of you who don't, for, for regression, it's also used for classification, but I use it for regression. And uh, it basically just at every, um, at every, at every x point, at every point, it 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 calculates whatever its predicted um, outcome value is going to be based on uh, the values of its nearest neighbors. So um, you can define. I don't know. I mean, I hope most of you guys already know about this. If not, I, I could probably find a pretty good picture that explains it better than I do. But um, you, can, you can actually define the number of neighbors that you want to use to um, calculate your predicted outcome variable. And, if, and then there's this, um, there's this trade-off. There's, there's this trade-off where if you choose too many neighbors, you'll have like an overly generalized, you'll have like an overly generalized um, model. And if you choose too few neighbors, um, you'll have uh, uh, a model that only works with your training set and nothing else. So um, uh, anyway, I picked 10. I found this rule online where, you know, you could set K to be square root of number of uh, samples you have, but that would be 37, which would take a long time. So I'm going to go ahead and run this chunk and then explain it to you guys. So we, we specified the model. We picked the nearest neighbors uh, model and set neighbors to 10. Uh, we set the engine. So the engine is like the package from which you are using the um, model. And we set mode regression. That is, I mean, I never had to like do predictive modeling using like all those different packages, but like I can imagine how difficult doing this would have been if you had to memorize all the different packages with all the different functions and how different the parameters of those functions would be. Um, but the cool thing about this uh, package, um, and I, I believe this is the Parsnip package that does this, is it just gives you a unified interface. It's very, it's very streamlined. It's very smooth, easy to use. Um, and for someone like me who doesn't know a whole lot um, about this, it's, it's very, it's, it's nice. So uh, we're going to go ahead and fit. We're going to go ahead and fit our. Um, go ahead and fit our model uh, onto, um, we're going to go ahead and fit our model onto our training data. And I, I did, this is kind of complicated, but I had, I had trouble with these steps. So I, I went ahead and did it this way, but basically what we're telling here, we're, we're, we're saying, this is the model that we defined here. We are fitting it. And then we're defining the data to be what you get when you prep that recipe that was based on our training data, but then extract the now transformed trading data. Um, I could have prepped in, I could have prepped it earlier, but um, another cool thing is that if you use this, uh, if you put your recipe, which contains your training data um, and the, the feature engineering steps that you wish to apply to your training data and also specify the model, this workflow object will prepare and um, I mean, the function names are prepare and bake, but it'll basically transform your training data according to your feature engineering steps for you. And then also including with it um, the, uh, the model that you wish to use. Um, so now you have this like singular object that contains both your pre-processing steps, um, well, your, your, your feature engineering steps rather, because pre-processing could also mean before you start the modeling process, but it contains your, um, your, how you want to process your data um, prior to feeding it to the model and also the model itself. Um, okay, cool. So now, uh, now that we fit it, um, let's see what KNN fit gives us. Okay, so we, now we have our model object and um, it, it, okay, so we have our, 
you know, we have our standard error. Uh, so that's cool. Does that mean we're done? No, not necessarily, because um, whatever fit that we have right now, it's going to be too uh, optimistic. We have to do it like, you know, a dozen more times for it to really, you know, be real. Um, and that's where cross-validation, this is the resampling re step, where cross-validation comes in. Um, so uh, it's pretty cool. You can uh, cross-validate your data. And I guess for those of you who don't know that basically like the most standard default cross-validation, you have 10, you take your data, you split into 10 categories uh, or, or 10, 10 folds, 10 bins rather. And then nine of them are, are withheld to be trained on. And then, or sorry, one of them is withheld to be as like the testing set within your training set. And then the nine others are used for training. Um, so you train nine, you test on one. Um, there's actually a cool uh, package that sort of shows this to you as an animation. Uh, maybe I'll pull it up and post it in the uh, uh, R Stats Club. But basically, it 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 both trains and tests um, uh, your model on your own training data, and then it uses a different one tenth training set um, for uh, uh, so that each each data point is used to both be trained and tested on uh this is very very cool way to explain it so here my computer and actually you can if you have uh multiple cores you could do uh, so now we can do let's do that whole thing again but this time let's use my multiple processor it's pretty cool all right let's do that again all right See if it works. All right, yeah. See that wasn't that faster. So you can do that too. You can you can register. You know. Um, so anyway, we have our uh, uh, RMSE, which um, I I I think I know what it stands for. I'm not going to try to say it because I feel like I'm going to be wrong. But and then we also have our R squared value. So that's cool. Um, that's that's what we're working with right now, uh, and so um, okay, that's interesting. And so we can see that our RMSE is about you know five thousand, uh, and uh, compared to uh, our mean, you know that's like less than half our mean. You know that's okay. Uh, all right, so let's 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 go ahead and let's fit it to our let's fit it to our testing data to see if. Um, oh, and here's a little, here's a plot you can make, uh, and it shows you how well um, the fit is to um, how well you were able to predict uh, using um, whatever regression you used. So um, you can see that it did pretty well. I mean, that's pretty good. Like the R squared value of um, 82.82. That's, that's good. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's pretty good. Like, I don't know, like for, I think that's, that's good enough. That's definitely good enough. Right. So um, you can see that we missed some points here, but that's okay. You know, it's that you're not, it's not going to be perfect. Um, so let's go ahead and use it on our testing data. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to use a predict function. Um, so we're, we're, we're throwing our, um, our fit in there, which I think that was, we're throwing our fit in there. And, um, but instead we're telling it to, instead of, instead of using the old data, you know, which was, um, uh, let's see, instead of using the old data, which was our training data, let's go ahead and um, use our, our, our feature engineered um, test data, but, but without excluding charges. Um, and then we're going to bind the columns of our test results with the true values after we use our model to predict. Um, uh, after we use our model to predict on the testing data, and we're going to look. And now we have our predicted values using our model alongside the true values, um, which is pretty cool. Which is pretty cool. Let's make a plot. 
So we do the same thing as before. We're kind of like seeing how well you can see that, like for the most part, we got it, right? We did it. Um, and uh, yeah, damn, that's like a pretty close, the RMSC is like pretty close there. I wonder what, I wonder if it's, Okay, so the RMSC is exactly the same. That shouldn't, that sh that should not happen. Um, I was having this trouble. I was having this problem earlier. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll fix this later because I don't want to take up everyone's time. But um, uh, you know, it's supposed to be slightly different. Ideally, it's supposed to be. Um, ideally, it's supposed to be slightly different. It's not supposed to be too different, but it's also not supposed to be exactly the same. Um, uh, let's, let's, let me double check. Okay. All right. Well, uh, okay. I'm going to figure that out and I'm going to, um, I'm going to send it, send an updated version into our Slack channel, but is, so far is everyone following me? Does everyone, does everyone like understand where I'm, um, I, I, what I just did. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna move on to uh, now we're gonna move on to, <laughs> now we're gonna move on to linear regression. So let's let's just go ahead and compare these two models for fun. So we're gonna just the cool thing about this is you can just repeat the same steps, but you just change out the like names of stuff. So here we're defining a linear model specification, and um, we're fitting it to our training data like before. And then we're putting the whole thing into um, a workflow. We're putting our recipe into a workflow, but we are using our linear model specification. So yes, that's very cool. Um, uh, so now here we have, um, uh, let me repeat some of those. Okay, yes, we cross validated again. Let's do that. And here, by the way, we have the argument save prediction. You want to save the predictions um, so that you can use them to um, predict. Um, okay. All right, so these two are different. And in fact, you can see that the linear model is uh, actually better as a lower RMSC and a higher R squared value. So, you know, sometimes it's good to just use the, uh, use, use the classics you know, um, so now we, we have our results, our predicted linear model, uh, our linear model predictions alongside the true values of our testing data. And now we're going to plot them. Um, this is a linear model. Yes, this is a linear model. Uh, we won't really be able to tell the difference between the how well the linear model did in its predictions and how well uh, nearest neighbors did because they were so close. But I mean, the, the difference in the RMSE, I would say, is, you know, worth looking at. I mean, I would definitely, if I was using these two models, if I was trying to decide the, between these two models, I would definitely pick the linear model. Um, and so now we're going to combine everything and plot these two uh, models against each other. And um, I think this is the sort of thing that's mostly interesting to look at. Again, I feel like um, if the difference between the two models was a bit more dramatic, you would be able to tell, uh, you would be able to get more out of looking at this plot, but um, it does look pretty cool. It is pretty cool to be able to plot these two against each other. Uh, and that's, that's it, that's my presentation. So in conclusion, we went through all of these steps. We performed our exploratory data analysis. We uh, pre-processed our data or rather processed our data, however you want to look at it, using recipes. Um, we, we used the K nearest neighbors model. Uh, we fit it to our training data. Um, we used uh, cross-validation to get accurate uh, error statistics. And we use it on our trade test data. We then wanted to compare it to another model to choose which model would be best. Um, so we picked linear model. We did the same steps with linear model in a very easy way as we did with uh, the K nearest neighbors model. 
and we discovered that um, the linear model is better for this particular data set, which would make sense because it's a very simple data set. But um, anyway, this is pretty cool. I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep using different uh, data sets and you know, try to get as good at this as I can. Um, and if you're interested, there is a book that the two co-authors of this package, two of the co-authors of this package, um, co-authored together uh, called Tidy Modeling with R that I suggest, highly suggest you guys check out. Um, and there are tons of free resources online so that you can get started uh, produce making uh, machine learning models and implementing machine learning methods in your projects. So um, thank you very much. And if you guys have any questions, I can screen share again and we can go back to whatever step you had questions about. So let me know.